Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Stevenson. I'm leading the OECD's work on education for human flourishing. This is an international initiative to shape the purposes and directions of education for the century ahead. It brings together the most senior policymakers, the people with the long-term responsibility for the lives of young people in seven high-performing jurisdictions, British Columbia in Canada, Finland, Estonia, Germany, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Singapore. Together, we're building a new narrative. Why education purposes need to change, what we mean by human flourishing, how education can prepare young people to flourish, and why this matters in an AI world. And the competencies and capacities we'll need to nurture if young people are to find their purpose in life through learning. We'll be hearing from Andrea Schleicher, who'll set the scene. I'll introduce the foundational arguments, and then we'll be talking to some of the key policymakers at the heart of this process, from British Columbia, Singapore, and Finland. Before coming to your own questions and comments, a huge number of you have already submitted them over the last few days. Please use the chat to react to today's discussion. This is part of what will be a dynamic international conversation over the months and years ahead, and we want to know what you think and to take full account of it. Well, let's make a start. Andrea Schleicher is Director for Education and Skills at the OECD, and he's sponsored and steered this initiative from the outset. Andreas. Thank you so much, Michael, and also for your leadership in this really important program. Uh, you know, education has created an amazing world around us, you know, everything that we have, our culture, our language, uh, our technology, the way what connect us today is all the fruit of education. At the same time, we also have to recognize that in the world of today, education has left us with some quite fundamental disconnects. You think about the disconnect between, you know, the infinite growth imperative and the finite resources of our planet is becoming, you know, glaringly clear these days. The disconnect between the financial economy and the real economy, the disconnect between the wealthy and the poor, between what we call our gross domestic product and the well-being of people, between what is technologically possible and the social needs of people, between, you know, our forms of governance and at least the perceived voicelessness of, of people. If we want to see a different world, we have to think about a different form of, of education and form of education that on the one hand, you know, keeps our world in balance. That's the agenda of sustainability. But at the very same time also helps people to live in a more volatile, complex and ambiguous world, uh, living in a more imbalanced world. If you just look, you know, how our traditional metrics fare, you know, our latest PISA assessment showed that, you know, 15-year-olds across the OECD can solve close to 60% of reading items and a little bit less, 50% of mathematics items. But then when we ask, you know, chat GPT and around the same time to solve those tasks, we could see in reading, you know, computers have pretty much outpaced people in processing information. And large language models are designed to do that. Mathematics is harder for artificial intelligence because, you know, it requires deep conceptual understanding, you know, mathematical modeling that's harder for computers uh, to do. You know? uh, but then when we repeated that, you know, six months later, you could see how AI had evolved. And a year later, you could see even in mathematics, you know, AI, was doing better than 15 year olds today. And that really shows us that the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, have become easy to, to digitize, to, to, to automate. Now, we need to think harder about other aspects. Perhaps more worryingly, you know, when we ask 15 year olds and 10 year olds about their creative skills, you could see that in almost every jurisdiction, 15 year olds reported lower levels of creativity. Creativity is the energy of the future. It drives innovation, it drives ideas. It, it not just, you know, technological, but also social innovation. And, you know, we're all born with an abundance of creativity. If you have a small, you know, three-year-old son or daughter, they're going to question anything you tell them. They're going to experiment with everything that gets into their hands. They're always willing to learn, always willing to unlearn and relearn. But then, you know, one day we put them into school and we try to make them compatible with established ways of thinking, 
We try to teach them answers rather than question the established wisdom of our time. And we see that energy diminishing. And that's also something we have to be aware of. We want to see a different world. We need to think about these things differently. Now, if you think about the purpose of education, it's perhaps not so difficult. I mean, the first thing is pretty obvious. You know, education is about helping you understand what's important to you, why you are here on this planet. Uh, I think this is perhaps the part that everybody would agree to. Education should help you figure out what you are good at and what you can become good at. And that's a non-trivial task. The education systems that are just like a supermarket offering students lots of choices are not achieving this goal as, you know, in the same way as education that are highly structured. But, you know, having that kind of process, it helps people understand, you know, what is my place in this world? How can I develop my talent? But that doesn't make you happy because we get happy always by making a difference in the world. So helping young people understand what this world asks them, what this world needs. And that's a function that schools often underestimate in their importance, not to give, give young people a, a window to the world. And last but not least, all support, you know, aligning, you know, better skills with better jobs and better lives. Now, I think that's something that, you know, we see a growing disconnect between the, you know, we have young people graduating from, you know, expensive universities and having difficulties finding a job, while employers say they cannot find the people with the skills they need. So this is also an important area that education needs to get better off. So this is, sounds like a simple agenda, but how do we make it visible? And I just in you know wrapping this up, I wanted to just share you some initial efforts to, to see this bigger picture. In our last PISA round, we looked not just at the academic performance, we try to capture the psychological well-being. Do students experience positive emotions? Are they happy with their life? Do they believe their life has meaning and purpose. Now, we look at agency and engagement. Can students mobilize their cognitive, social, and emotional resources? Not just learn stuff, but do things. Now, that concept of agency is so important. Now, what is my role, my responsibility? Can I adjust my place in this life? Now, emotional resilience. Can I reimagine, reinvent myself when the context changes? Now, something that we are not born with, humans, you know, like stability, resilience is something we have to learn. No. Do young people go to school as consumers that just, you know, take things away? Or are they actually active contributors, co-creators of the learning environments? No, the quality of human relationships. How do students relate to students? How do students perceive their educators? Are they just instructors or also good coaches, great mentors, great facilitators? No. Also, the uh, way, you know, do students have a life beyond school? Like, can they take ownership of their life, you know, manage it? That's you know, something that we expect the day they graduate. You know? What about school? You know? The material and cultural well-being. And last but not least, you know, do students grow up with the idea that the world offers multiple perspectives, different, different ideas? You know? It's very easy for young people to grow up with one narrative these days. And technology can actually make you be happy and live in a false narrative. You know? To what extent are young people open to diversity, pluralistic perspectives and ideas? And you know, just to highlight a, a couple of results from this, just to give you a sense of this. Now, if you look at traditional metrics, you know, academic success, Singapore always tops the chart on PISA. Whatever you look at, you know, Singapore comes out first on academic performance. But if you scratch the surface and look at some of the other dimensions, you can see there's a lot of scope for improvement, even in the top performer academically. Now, Singaporean kids are not that happy. They do not show that high level of emotional resilience. Now, they do not have much of a life beyond schooling. If you look at another country, Albania, it's almost the mirror image of Singapore. You know, Albanian, Albanian students get 10 out of 10 points on, you know, they're happy with their lives. They see meaning and purpose, but they are not really good academically. Now you may ask yourself, well, maybe we have to make a choice between, you know, students being happy with their lives or doing well academically. But, you know, you can look at a country like Denmark that seems to get most of these things right. And I do think it is important for us when we talk about human flourishing to look at education through a broader lens and to make those broader perspectives really visible as well. Final slide.
what is the driver of this? And this is, I think, also very, very important in the context of human flourishing. When you look, actually, ownership of learning was best predicted, not by what people did, but by the quality of student relationships with their teachers. Now, where having the sense that my teacher knows who I am, who I want to become, ready to accompany me on, on this journey. And that was actually also the best predictor of academic success. And so I think we need to get away from this notion that, you know, human flourishing and academic success are in competition. Actually, they are. I think the synergy between them is one thing that we should be looking for. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Andreas. Um, and um, if that's a, a, a set of steers from PISA 22 about how education might evolve over the years ahead, then education for human flourishing um, is a response to those steers. And you'll judge how far it's a good response. But what I'd like to do now is just turn to some of those foundational arguments that we've been rehearsing in uh, this network of high performing systems that will give you a sense of uh, education for human flourishing, the narrative. Just waiting for those slides to come up. Thank you. And uh, we'll go straight on to the next. So three future principles that these education systems um, would like to see embedded in education in the future. And as I say, that's countries or jurisdictions from Canada all the way through to Singapore in Asia. Um, the first, that education should equip the next generation to remake the future. Um, we come out of the 20th into the 21st century with organizational, economic, social models that are no longer so fit for purpose. All of them will need to be renewed and remade by the next generation. Second, if it's true that education has been in some sense divisive and put the greatest weight on cognitive capabilities expressed in cognitive examinations, then in future, we should look to nurture other capabilities too, including the caring and the creative. And third, that education, recognizing that young people around the world, particularly in and since the pandemic, often ask what the point of all of this is and say there's a lack of meaning in their lives. Uh, how can we address that and offer people ways to interpret, appreciate and contribute to the world? Those would be the principles, the systems of the future uh, in an education for human flourishing world. Next slide. What do we mean by human flourishing? There are many accounts. But Aristotle's is a good one to start with, though it comes from ancient Greece. Um, four dimensions, happiness, friendship, relationships, meaning, that word again, and then accomplishment, but not necessarily accomplishment expressed in purely academic terms. In fact, definitely much more than that. Next slide. So education for human flourishing. Well, three ideas. One, that it would prepare people with those dimensions of human flourishing in mind to pursue moral, reason-infused, emotionally driven activities that mean something to the person but also convey some kind of significance in the world, however you think about that. Activities that would also support the development of a contemplative approach and inspire um, awe and wonder this remarkable universe in which we live. Um, that's the heart of it. We're conscious that it's important to reconcile education for human flourishing. Maybe looking back from the end of your life, um, did I flourish? With something more immediate, um, education for student well-being. What kind of time am I having right now in my school, my college, good or bad? How could it be better? These are different concepts, but they need to support one another. Uh, we won't get education for human flourishing unless we first put down those foundations for student well-being. And then just that broader concept. Um, human flourishing is not just about me or you, one's individual flourishing. It is that of the community. 
of the society, of the planet itself. And that's what we draw from other traditions, be they Ubuntu or Confucianism or Buddhism. And we also maybe have a responsibility when we think about flourishing to think forward. All the lives that have not yet been lived, human lives and those of other species, how do we contribute to the, the flourishing of all of that too? Next slide. This all happens against an AI backdrop. The fear that it won't be the humans who flourish, it'll be the robots. You can think about narrow AI, the AI that we have at the moment, the ability of AI to solve the tasks we give it. And that's problematic enough, creating enormous challenges, for example, for our system principles. You know, if AI rocks in some sense, ideas of human autonomy and purpose, um, then that's something to be taken account of as we construct education for human flourishing. But I just want to touch on here on the bigger vista of general AI, which lies somewhere ahead, be it five years or 500. But here there are huge risks that artificial intelligence could come to overwhelm us, um, to harness our efforts, but to be in charge. Um, but what better way to steer the development of general purpose AI over the many years ahead than to equip a young generation with the goals of education for human flourishing, to bring their science, their technology, their ethics to control the process. Um, next slide. We've thought about five competencies that might support a young generation um, in their pursuit of human flourishing. And they're these, adaptive problem solving, not just simple problem solving, but learning from all the problems you ever solved in order to um, solve the one in front of you now. Ethical reasoning, uh, weighing the needs and interests of others in the decisions that you take. And then three linked competencies that touch on meaning making, interpreting the world, a synthesis of all of those very different worldviews out there, appreciating the world, extracting beauty from beautiful experiences and asking yourself, how should I respond to all of that? And then expressing oneself in the world, your passions, your music, your sport, your volunteering, if you like stamping your meaning on the external environment. All of these we think are teachable, measurable, and they're not instead of math, science and reading, they build on them, but they help young people find their purpose in life through learning. Next slide. Where next with this? Well, those are the foundational arguments, but the countries and jurisdictions involved in this work are all developing particular dimensions of what it is to be an education system in response. Singapore, thinking about learning environments. Australia, AI and learning and assessment. One of our experts, thinking about leaders and teachers. British Columbia, thinking about equity. System design is being carried forward by all seven of the jurisdictions together, and so are metrics. So that is where we go next, over the next year, before we actually publish the final conceptual framework, Education for Human Flourishing. Uh, final slide, I think, Kevin. Um, so that is where we've come to, um, working with these seven jurisdictions. Those are the ideas, and I now want to introduce some of the countries who are at the heart of this work and um, share with you their reflections on what's going on and why it matters. Uh, a couple of days ago, I had a chance to talk to British Columbia, Melanie Stewart, uh, associate to um, a deputy minister in the education and childcare ministry there in Canada, and uh, Chen Wei Sung, the deputy director general in the Singaporean ministry with the responsibility for Singapore for uh, curriculum both of them at the heart of this work for some years now. And I began by asking Melanie if she would reflect on um, quite how this is being received in British Columbia. There's no question that the concept of education for human flourishing really resonates in BC. For us, it really is a, con a continuation of work that we began in 2012, which we referred to as transformation. And what was behind the idea of education transformation in BC was this recognition that 
we can no longer focus only on giving children content and knowledge, but we needed to shift beyond just content-based curriculum into something that was recognizing the importance of competencies, that was actually going beyond um, rote knowledge and into an understanding of the kinds of skills and abilities that our students would need for the future. A future that was changing incredibly rapidly. And so we wanted our, our kids to be able to um, face the challenges of a dynamic world with, with skills and confidence. And so we shifted the, our whole curriculum from 2012 through 2016 when we started implementing it through the younger grades and then finally through our high school um, grades in 2019. A part of this journey has been really recognizing that we are not just educating people for jobs, for economic roles in society, but also their whole person. And so integrating the importance of social and emotional learning into the journey and really seeing the whole child and the whole human being. I think what's been so exciting about this latest work in the High Performing Systems for Tomorrow is taking that core of education for human flourishing and expanding it even more into an understanding of how, how we can um, create a sense of meaning for students or help them on that journey of what meaning is and, and so that their, their lives and their journey um, has, has that sense of purpose and agency so that we have citizens in the world that can actually take confident action to make the world a better place. And it really is, I think, also about that shift from individuals to a recognition of collective action and community as being integral to, um, to education. Thank you, Melanie. And Chen Wei, if you think of this from a Singaporean perspective, how does education for human flourishing resonate there? Mm, thanks, Michael. Uh, like in BC, uh, this vision of uh, education for human flourishing has strong resonance, uh, even in Singapore. Um, in, in our system, we have always seen education system as a social leveler, helping every student to thrive and be the best of themselves and uh, contributes towards the collective uh, well-being of the society. These are very established uh, aspirations for education uh, in Singapore. Um, but we have seen in recent years several uh, building up of pressure points, uh, ranging from the emergence of uh, general AI, uh, that is uh, blurring the line between what machine and humans can do. So we have seen how uh, environmental concerns are posing really existential threats uh, to the human race. We have seen the growing concerns with uh, well-being issues that our youth are, are confronting. So these are new and uh, severe challenges that are forcing us to reimagine what education can do better uh, in order to help our students thrive in the world of tomorrow. And so the vision of uh, education for human flourishing has a strong resonance with us because it focuses on aspects like helping you to find meaning and purpose in their lives, <clears throat> helping them to be adaptable and um, have the wisdom to make ethical and responsible decisions and contribute to the flourishing of the community and of um, uh, uh, the collective and not just individually. I think these are indeed very noble aspirations that uh, Singaporeans uh, do find uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, resonance with. Thanks. Thank you. I think one of the striking aspects of the work is the way all the countries have come behind um, the thinking and contributed their own perspectives on issues of importance. And Melanie, in British Columbia, you've been leading the thinking on what all of this might mean for equity. Um, can you just share with us some of the initial perspectives on the um, equity um, implications of education for human flourishing? So in our context, uh, of course, we think about uh, First Nations principles of learning and how we integrate that into our, into our understanding of education for human flourishing as well. It's been a, a key focus for us over the last number of years to improve outcomes for First Nations and Indigenous students across our province and to do so in a way that recognizes and, and uh, supports culture, cultural difference. We also are at a unique time in our, in our history 
where we are actually growing as a province, welcoming more immigrants to the province than we ever have. And so with that comes a great deal of cultural diversity. And so it's, it's part of the, the challenge and the richness of our education system that we're able to integrate all of these different voices and perspectives into how our children are, are being educated and taught to think about a very complex, exciting, uh, and culturally diverse world in the future. So I think this has been uh, fundamental for us and I think will continue to be really important as we go forward. We've integrated into into all of our accountability measures for our system as well, being really mindful of making sure that different groups of children, whether they, they be children with diverse abilities and disabilities or uh, First Nations children or English language learners or children in youth and care, that all of the diverse backgrounds in our province are, are having their needs met and are being uh, recognized and celebrated for the, um, for the diverse perspectives and, and uh, what, what they can bring to the, the fabric of our society. Terrific. Thank you. And Chen Wei Singapore's specialist subject, if you like, has been the meaning of all of this for learning environments, uh, the way and the where of how young people learn. Just share a little of the early thinking on that critical topic. In the work of Education for Human Flourishing, we talk about adaptive thinking, we talk about uh, uh, ethical reasoning. Those are indeed important 21st century skills, and we consider aspects like civic literacy, uh, creativity, uh, collaboration skills are all part of this important set of skills and dispositions that our students must have going forward. And in order for the learning environment to deliver those uh, outcomes to our students, they must, I think, do two things well. One is within the space of the academic curriculum, find ways of designing the curriculum better so that it allows students to develop those skills more effectively and uh, more naturally. And I think there's a lot of room for us to be better in those areas because the academic curriculum takes up such a lot of time in the students' lives in schools. And if you under-harness that component for developing 21st century skills, I think it's such a, it's such a pity. But beyond that, the way we look at learning environment is one that must also make use of the non-curricular, non-academic spaces as well, which means that the life of kids outside of the classes when they are taking part in enrichment programs or co-curricular programs is another important platform where 21st century skills are very effectively developed. I would argue in some of those skills, they are better de developed in the co-curricular spaces than the academic spaces. And so to us, the learning environment going forward must be one where we make good use of the total curriculum, both academic and non-academic, and have a whole school approach to um, agree on some of these important 21st century skills that ought to be developed well through the uh, students' experiences in the school. Uh, and, and I hope that is something that we will always continue to do better in. And uh, I think if we are able to do that, our students are able to probably thrive more going forward. Thank you. Let's just close with a final thought. I'd like to ask both of you really, what kind of change this represents? Um, how far is this evolutionary? Um, in some sense, an incremental shift from where we are, but incremental. How far is it revolution? And though I know one's instincts are always to say, no, no, so it's evolutionary. Actually, there's a question about the time scale and whether we have the time to do this on an evolutionary basis. So, Melanie, just take um, a moment, uh, a quick moment to uh, close with that question. I think the concept of revolution is associated with sort of great disruption and uh, something very um, intense in the system. And I think that is unhelpful in terms of our education and the way that we develop our system. I think we think of it as an ongoing evolution that is nevertheless transformative. So that we're continuing to evolve our system, but that doesn't mean that we're being timid in that approach or that it's not creating a significant change. I think it's more an understanding that we, we need to continue to, to develop, to change, to, to reflect how things are, are um, evolving. I also just want to note, though, that I think we sometimes fall into it, this trap that that whatever is new and is uh, you know novel is better and is 
is something that we need to to um, to embrace, and that there's sort of an inevitability about human progress, things always getting better and better and better. And I think it's important that it, we recognize that sometimes it's about looping back to things that have worked for us in the past, making sure that we're bringing those threads forward into what we do in, in the future and in the present. So I, I just think that there's a lot of tensions in here in how we think about how we evolve, but I think for, for us, it's about um, having that positive agency for um, how we evolve together in our system. Thank you. Chen Wei, evolution or revolution? Uh, I agree fully with Melanie, actually. So uh, some have uh, used this analogy of uh, overhauling an education system on the fly, akin to uh, you know, rebuilding a car uh, when it's, uh, it's still being driven, right? If you have that Im image in your mind, it's actually horrifying to think of fixing a car when it's still on the move or rebuilding a car when it's on the move. It's highly likely that you will fail, the car will crash. Uh, and so to overhaul an entire education system has a huge risk. Uh, both because you may not exactly get it right, you may actually end up with a weaker system than before, but also because not the entire system needs that approach. Because the education system comprises of many component parts. Some of it is about teacher recruitment and development, some of it is about curriculum designing and uh, implementation, some of it is about school uh, resourcing or uh, school management. So there are many components of an education system. And when you want the system to be better than before, you may want to take a revolutionary approach with some components, but not with the entire system. Uh, and I, I think that approach is a lot more uh, practical uh, in the context of education where many of the outcomes you want to achieve takes decades to manifest. And so if you rush into dismantling a system, trying to build an entirely different and hopefully better one, you actually do not know whether you have got it right for decades to come. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Well, that was uh, Chen Wei Sing from Singapore and Melanie Stewart from British Columbia talking to me just a day or two ago. But I'd like to turn now on live to Anita Lei Koinen, uh, who is Permanent Secretary, Education and Culture in Finland, um, who is steering remarkable work on the future direction of the Finnish system right now. Um, and we'll come to that in a few minutes, Anita. But I wonder whether I could begin by asking you this. Um, why do you think education for human flourishing has caught people's attention in Finland in the way that it seems to have done? Mm. Thank you, Michael. This is a very interesting question because obviously we are very concerned with our learning outcomes in PISA and also in national uh, reviews which show a bad trend. But also at the same time, there was a very clever decision by the uh, present government that they do what they absolutely have to do first, providing uh, support to all kinds of learners to, throughout the education system, and this is being done now, and also a reform to put extra hours in mathematics and reading skills to basic education. But then the idea that we really have to take some time to revisit the goals and aims and purpose of education for the next hundred years or so. And this is something that resonates very well, an enthusiastic response we have had from researchers, obviously, educators, but also stakeholders in wider society in Finland. Because people see that our young people, they are not getting what they want from education. They are feeling unhappy. There are lots of uh, mental health issues among young people and also well-being has worsened, obviously uh, because of the pandemic, but also perhaps that people don't find that education gives the sense of purpose and also the kind of expression of themselves and perhaps not nurturing creativity as much as it should. So the idea of taking a longer time to really think about the needs we need to do at the curriculum reform, but also perhaps in the education system, even revisiting 
uh, educa teacher education and training in Finland. So big profound changes in Finnish society, both economic, societal and obviously ecological reasons, they are all behind this. And I think Finnish people see that there is really a need to do something and think before taking any kind of uh, sudden changes in curricular development, for example. Thank you. So a lot of uh, momentum, but shifting the direction of a whole national education system is no trivial task, uh, but that's what you've taken on. So just say a bit about how you're going about that. Mm. We decided not to have a kind of typical solution to set up a working group or task force, but we have a different kind of structure where we have uh, 44 different stakeholders represented in this work. And it is led by a researcher from the university. And actually, she is a brain researcher, not an education uh, person as such. And the idea is that it will be a very, very kind of participatory uh, system. And we are launching online uh, discussion in August and September, which is very good so that we can get everybody aboard. And obviously the challenge is all, always that you don't have just the progressive educators involved in discussion, but really make sure that you have educators, researchers, employers, and the economic structures, and of course then parents also, young people taking their saying what they want. And we are also trying out new ways of engaging the whole society. For example, we are going to have kind of targeted dialogues with those groups and people who do not generally take part in these uh, kinds of discussions. And this is a, a very important part of the whole process. So get the whole society to think about education, which is so very dear to Finland. It has been since the nation building and it has brought us very good uh, economic prosperity and now we see that the change is coming and we have to involve everybody so that the new thoughts are acceptable for all families too so that we can make understandable and the dialogue is then the answer. You touched there on uh, economy and economic projections are challenging globally and in Finland, I remember being in a conversation about a year ago with you in Helsinki and a senior economic policymaker said, you know, the projections for growth in this country are half a percent for a few years and then they go to totally flat. So what's the place of work in your vision of the future, your human flourishing vision? Um, can education for human flourishing not only find a place for work, people will go on working at the heart of their lives, but actually improve economic performance at national level. Yes, absolutely. Because we know, know that there's huge potential in new kind of growth, which uh, tells us not to exceed planetary boundaries as we have done so far. And well-being of people can be something else also, not only economic well-being. But obviously we know that jobs, paid jobs, as we now know, they are not so many and they are not available for everybody. So nurturing creativity, really, that we can take action to mold our futures, not just that education and people always have to adjust. They can actually take action. So this is very important for the education system. And it's the only thing that we can actually renew our human capital so we can be creative. AI can't be more creative than we are. But of course, we will need to take uh, good uh, you know, uh, benefit from uh, AI as we are doing already in education system, but make sure that we as humans will flourish and our planet will uh, flourish and we make the best use of the developing technology, but then the kind of ethical decision making or reasoning and also what it means for human being, the purpose of education, 
that has been always important for us, and now we just have to revisit what it means in the future. Thank you. Let's bring in Andreas to join you, and let's open this conversation up to people who've joined us from around the world, um, and also some who've sent in uh, questions and thoughts beforehand. Um, and Andreas might start with you and stick with that AI theme that um, uh, uh, Anita just opened up there. We had a, um, uh, a question from the US, I think. Um, how does AI change what it means um, to know and to do? I mean, do we need um, to read books if AI can summarize them for us? Well, I would actually argue that we need to do it even more if uh, we don't want to just become slaves of, you know, information thrown at us. If we want to take an active role in, you know, uh, shaping the future in our understanding, actually, we need to become even better than we were in the past. You know, in the past, reading was about extracting knowledge from, you know, carefully curated text. Today, it's about humans being able to construct knowledge, to navigate ambiguity, to manage, you know, conflicting pieces and to make judgments. You know, the one thing that AI will not provide in the foreseeable future is consciousness, you know, being aware of ourselves. And I do think that, uh, you know, there are a lot of things we may no, no longer need to know, but I think we need to have a deep conceptual understanding of different areas so that we can navigate the information uh, that we receive. You know? Uh, Felix Sarokia Raj from India, um, same sort of area, asks, can AI help teach not just the cognitive competencies, but the behavioral and emotional ones too? And I might stay with you, Andreas, for that. You know, uh, I'm not sure about uh, teaching those, but I think it can help teachers to become much more aware of those dimensions. AI is actually incredibly powerful in diagnostic diagnostics, understanding how students learn and how they learn differently. And I think it can give teachers the tools to actually engage with that much more productively. Uh, in a way, so far, we have looked at students' work through academic results. And with AI, I think you can get a much better understanding of the, you know, what gets students interested, what gets them bored, uh, 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 where they, you know, engage, where they get, you know, disaffected. And I, I believe there's huge potential. You know, AI... It's not going to replace teachers, but teachers who are good at using AI will replace teachers who struggle with this. And so I think harnessing the power of AI and its analytics to engage with the students in a much more holistic way, I think is a huge promise of, of artificial intelligence. Now, it's not a magic power. You know, it's going to amplify good practices in education as well as it can amplify poor practice. You know, it can make the work of teachers more scripted, more narrow, more focused actually on very narrow academic content, or it can, you know, widen our possibilities to see students in a much more holistic way. You know, I think there's great promise in that. Thank you. I come to you, Anita. Um, a number of people are interested in uh, the implications of AI for equity. Can policymakers and educators make sure that AI in schools doesn't actually exacerbate educational inequities, make things worse? This is a very important question, and I think it all comes back to the question, or the first question, about the motivation to learn. How can we and teachers and education systems motivate learners to learn when many people can see that the AI will actually be enough? It's building its uh, capacities, and this is one of the key questions of teaching profession in the coming years. It is already now, but I think this is very important. And equity uh, is a, one of the big, biggest challenges, not only in Finland, but I think uh, at a global level. And this is one of the human flourishing aspects. How can we communicate with each other and build this kind of uh, flourishing, not only at individual level, but at community, society, and also at global level. So there, there are all means that we have to be aware of the possibilities and threats AI bring and choose the good side. Because I think AI will give more time for teachers and learners to interact 
and we know that most of sense building and learning happens in interaction. So this could be an answer. And also this kind of individual help uh, and uh, support for individual learners can be helped by AI. But definitely we have to start perhaps also with teachers and teachers' attitudes and also capabilities of understanding what AI means and how it can be of help to teaching, but also perhaps give room for better informed education policies. When we use AI, we use data more kind of in an innovative way and be uh, truthful to ourselves that we can make technology help to uh, create better policies also. Michael. Thank you. Michael, I, I actually would probably go even one step further. Mm -hmm. I would say that we will not achieve equity in education without AI, because our kind of one size fits all approaches uh, simply do not do justice to different needs, interests, motivations of learners. And this is exactly where AI comes in. It will help us to understand how different learners learn differently and engage with us. You can already see now students with special needs suddenly have, you know, opportunities through AI that they would never had uh, in, in the past. You know, I, I do think, and what I need to highlight it, you know, the quality of interactions, you know, informed by evidence rather than just impressions. I think it's a huge potential. I, I, I do not believe that education can deliver on its promise of equity without harnessing the power of AI. It has not so far, and there's no reason to believe that it will do in the future unless we make education a much more personal, a much more adaptive, a much more interactive experience. We've had a couple of questions while you've both been talking, um, which say, well, everyone's very confident that AI will mean not only a better life for learners, but a better life for teachers, and they will be able to do the things they always wanted to do, to develop the whole child, um, to, to make sure that each child's individual needs are better met. Um, but beyond the confidence that you both express, have you got evidence? Can you, people are asking, actually point to places around the world, maybe you've got evidence in Finland, Anita, of this actually happening, where teachers are beginning to see that they can use the new technologies in order to be the better teacher they always wanted to be? Perhaps begin with you, Anita. Yes, uh, actually we can see with the individual uh, very knowledgeable and enthusiastic teachers, they have taken AI into practice already, and it is actually one of the topics in our future of education exercise. And we have researchers in the field and uh, 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 teachers also. And then uh, the Ministry of Education and Culture, together with our National Agency for Education, we are now drafting recommendations for the use of AI in, in schools, in education. And obviously we follow the good work that is done at international level by OECD and UNESCO. But still, uh, we can see that there is evidence. Actually, we organized a roundtable discussion around AI with our Minister of Education. And I must say that we were perhaps all surprised how well knowledgeable and enthusiastic the teachers were and they actually had good evidence how they could take into uh, uh, take individual learners were much more uh, better catered for throughout the AI because then you can have individual uh, teaching going on at the same time for many people and also these groups that do not flourish in our present education system, they have been very much taken into these new experiments. So there is growing evidence, definitely. Andreas, the wider evidence base? Yeah, you know, I would agree, you know, but again, you know, AI is not a magic power. It's an incredible amplifier and an amazing accelerator. It's going to amplify good pedagogical practice in the same way it can amplify more pre pedagogical practice. Now, it can actually make learning more scripted, more, you know, passive, more reactive, more, or it can, you know, super empower teachers in the way Anita displays. And actually, I, I've also seen many, many really interesting examples for this. If you go to the 
Korean uh, digital textbooks, you know, students now get, you know, their personalized homework. They, the teacher understands, you know, where students progress, where they get stuck, where they get interested, where they get bored and can respond to this in a much more dynamic way. I've seen an amazing example where, you know, a student's library use was analyzed through AI and uh, giving teachers clues where students have, you know, psychological difficulties, uh, even, you know, propensity to suicide that, you know, the students might have not have understood themselves, but, and the teachers would have never talked to them, but they could read those signals through, you know, big data analysis. I see them amazing, amazing possibilities. And I think, you know, teachers need to become, you know, creative designers using those kinds of technologies. And then, you know, I think many of these promises can materialize at scale. If you ask me today, do we have evidence at scale? Not really, you know, actually we see a pretty flat relationship between technology intensity in schools and, and, and these are outcomes. We actually see in some cases, technology intensity being negatively related to both cognitive and social and emotional outcomes. So I think it is, again, you know, it's an amplifier, accelerator, and, you know, it will depend much more on teachers in the future than in the past, how this plays out. Thank you. So let's broaden out last few minutes. Um, yes. People are asking whether we can actually make something real out of education for human flourishing. Um, how do you go about putting it into the middle of a national education system? So to you, Anita, um, uh, where do the competencies we were describing go from adaptive problem solving all the way through to expressing yourself in the world? Do they go into the next national curriculum? How do you see all of that? I think we have uh, quite well taken into account the sustainability needs. So that is in our legislation starting from early childhood education and care. But uh, it will take time, obviously, before uh, we get those well-educated people who think of the planet as being our uh, responsibility as a whole humankind. But then uh, these new competencies, we need to define them. And obviously, there is also a will to uh, be able to measure them. And I would say that the, we will have to take better care of the social emo emotional skills. Uh, it has been a kind of, uh, I would say, a bit sensitive topic here in, in Finland to some extent. But we can see that this is something that we absolutely need to take better uh, care of. And also then perhaps not to, there has been a strong emphasis always on cognitive skills, on academic skills, and still there is to some extent, but also so that people would be more creative and uh, I would say the agency of students throughout the system, they will need to be tackled in the next curriculum uh, reform. And the most important thing is that we now take the time it takes to really think of the new needs for the new national core curriculum. And there is a big autonomy for our teachers, which is good, but we also need to think, uh, when we think about curriculum change, there is always teachers are involved, but perhaps even better communication is now needed. And what is very important is that we have to engage municipalities, about the 300 municipalities in Finland who are actually responsible for uh, K-12 to education. And this is something that I think uh, needs even more uh, refined processes. But then a national core curriculum and the kind of how can we articulate the purpose, the aims of education that would make it possible for every single person to flourish as a human being, but also be responsible at com uh, community level, but also at national and even at global level. So this is the question and it takes some time. And this was the big innovation that it can't be, you know, decided on in a few weeks by a uh, wide working group. Uh, it needs time, and that's a big thing. Thank you. Andreas, PISA plays a huge role in supporting and shaping education around the world. 
what does education for human flourishing potentially mean for the next phase of development in Pisa? Yeah, you know, Michael, I think um, uh, Anita made a really important point. A lot really depends on metrics. If you explain your five competency classes to a modern employer, they'll, you know, have no issues with They think that's, yes, this is what's needed for the future. I think the world is ready for that. The biggest obstacle are we ourselves in education, you know, and to some extent parents, you know, and, and why is education so conservative? Because it's driven by metrics that only vary a very narrow slice of those five, five dimensions that you are. So I do believe the answer really lies in broadening our metrics, making the invisible visible, the cognitive, social, emotional outcomes that underpin human flourishing. The moment people see it, teachers see it, get, you know, the work of teachers get valued for those contributions they make, the moment behavior will change. I'm less, you know, focused on curriculum. You know, I think the curriculum is almost a consequence. I'm focused on you know, the outcomes that become visible to people and tangible so that this is becoming a real agenda. And then, you know, curricula and instructional practice, all of this is likely to adapt. And, you know, and, and PISA clearly has a responsibility on this. And I, in fact, the data that I presented to you highlight that actually many of those dimensions have become measurable. You know, we just have to become a lot more creative on what we call measurement. And we have to be more courageous, you know, not sacrificing validity gains for efficiency gains in assessment and not sacrificing relevance for reliability. You know, those are the big risks. And I think if we take that courage, uh, I think there's a lot that PISA can contribute to build, you know, a broader set of metrics that represents human flourishing. And that will no doubt also trickle down to, to national assessments and evaluation and exams. A final question for each of you, just 30 seconds each, if you would. Um, look out from here 10 years time. Anita, what do you think might have been achieved by then in terms of the direction uh, that we've been talking about here towards education for human flourishing? I think more national consensus that this is absolutely necessary, but also I think uh, PISA and international collaboration will help it come true. Thank you. Andreas? I would agree with this, and I would also re-emphasize, you know, Anita's point on communication. We have to become much more active and outgoing and explain the why. What drives the, the what in education, you know, what we do in the curriculum drives compliance. People will do what you say, but it is the why that actually will create ownership. And I think we have to be much become much better on, on making a good case for them. Thank you both. So just a word as we close on where all of this goes next. Over the next nine months, we'll complete the conceptual framework, an end-to-end -end narrative, what it takes to embed it. And after that, three things, uh, more technical work on assessing these competencies. How do we do that and do it well? Capacity building, helping policymakers figure out how to lead the change. And above all, a wider engagement with audiences everywhere. Governments, yes, but above all, students and teachers. So thank you all of you who've joined us today or are watching on playback. It's been terrific to see your engagement in the Education for Human Flourishing conversation, your questions, your challenges, your suggestions. You'll find the links in the chat and on the website to a recording of this webinar, the slides we've used today, and the current iteration of the conceptual framework. But with that, um, I'll say goodbye, thanking all of our guests, Andreas, Anita, Chen Wei, and Melanie, and again, all of you for joining us today. Goodbye. Have a good weekend.